Tesla mega packs are a big, big deal. Uh, so are the 4680s. We've got some battery considerations to discuss today. I am joined by my good friend, Randy Kirk. We're going to get all into it. I'm Brian. Welcome to Futuraza. <laughs> So, Randy, you made a bold prediction a while back. Uh, we're still looking at some of your crazy, crazy th stuff from the end of last year. This one was Tesla will announce, you believe, a run rate of 4680s no later than August of 100 gigawatt hours. And uh, let's start there. Uh, tell me why you think. Well, first of all, what do you think they're at today? And where do you think uh, they will be? How will they get there? All right. So what you've got is, first of all, maybe I should talk a little bit about the way that I come to my conclusions, because I'm not there. I don't have anybody inside that I'm talking to. Unlike you, I'm not doing any original reporting. I am not going out there and, and, and trying to find ways to get inside information. I listen to what Elon Musk says. I listen to what the other executives say. And I don't trust all of it, but I use it as one data point. And the data point that they've given us with regard to 4680s is that they anticipate having starting to put up the next four lines of 4680 in the second half of this year. Why would you actually start to put those lines into production? You'd put those lines into production because your other four are now producing. Um, you probably aren't going to go too far in the development of the next set, the phase two, so to speak, unless phase one is nearly completed or completed. Also, the evidence would suggest that that was the um, directionality of their curve. And so that suggests that they should get close to that 100 run rate, 100 gigawatt run rate by, when I say the middle of the year, let's call it July, August, somewhere around there, they should be at the 100 gigawatt run rate, which means by the end of the year, they could have some of those new lines up and running, which could get them over the 100 gigawatt run rate by the end of the year. Now, I could be completely wrong because, again, they could end up having problems that they didn't foresee. Um, they could end up, uh, you know, having an engineering problem that they can't get past. They get it to a certain level and they just can't get the next level. But Theoretically, they should be getting to the point now where the first of the four lines should be pretty much at max speed, which now it's just a matter of paste, cut and paste for the other three lines. And then each line will take a while to get to where it needs to get. So that's kind of how I came to the conclusion. So the question then is, what do you think is the run rate today? Yeah, so I'm going to I here. Let me see here. Uh, oh, there it is. I would say knuckle sandwich, mm. oh, no, my sorry. favorite. <laughs> I'm going to say 30. I don't know, Brian. Um, it, it would have to be somewhere in the range of 30 gigawatts right now in order to get to 100 gigawatts by August. So I'm that that would be again a deduction or an interpolation, if you will, uh, from my conclusion back to what it would need to be today in order to get there. Well, we know that one line is running pretty well. We know that additional lines are operational, uh, being dialed in. We don't know to what degree. We assume a very low level. Uh, but getting to 100 gigawatts, Giga Nevada is only, what, 35, 40? Well, again, there's no question that that's the goal. We there's no. It's not like we have this is a surprise. The total capacity for the first phase was 100 gigawatts. No doubt that's been stated, restated and restated. The second phase, the new four lines that they said they're putting in starting the second half of this year, that's not a secret. That's going to double the capacity to 200 gigawatts. All that is clear. So the only question is from the run rate that we saw just a few months ago, which would have been like three gigawatts or four or something like that. Have they been able to double and double again and double again? Did they get to a place which they must have anticipated they were going to where the issue was just continually speeding it up and that they weren't going to run into huge engineering challenges? I think I think they are well short of even three or four is my guess, just based on 
the output capacity that they're running at today and the fact that they only have a couple weeks of pre-built packs ready to go. But now the second part of, of that prediction you had was the investing public will still, whatever the big ramp is, whatever it is, the big the public will still refuse to understand that this adds a buck fifty to earnings, which will increase to three dollars or more in 2025. Talk to me. Okay, so if you if you did do get to the hundred gigawatt hour run rate, now will it now again depending on when they hit it and how much they are able to get out of the next four, which again will just be cut and paste from the first four depending on how fast they're able to ramp up through this year, if they got 100 gigawatts from all places, from Cato Road, from all of the activity at uh, Austin, um, then if you have a total of 100 gigawatts, you multiply that times $3.50 $3 a, a kilowatt hour for the manufacturer of those batteries and another 10 bucks per kilowatt hour for putting them into a pack. That $4.50 times 100 comes out to $4.5 billion in money from the federal government. Um, and if you divide that by roughly 3 billion shares, then you get your buck and a half uh, number. And then if you then continue that ramp into 2025 and you get to 200 gigawatts from all locations in 2025, that will include Reno, where they're going to be putting in, we don't know, phase one, two, three, four, five, there's going to be uh, eventually 500 gigawatts in Reno. Um, if you get some production out of Reno in 2025, you might get a total of 200. Now you're doubling that to $3 a share, just in money that the federal government is going to, that Donald Trump will sign a check. <laughs> just playing. <laughs> the beauty is normally when you do R&D, you have to cover it yourself. Cato Road is an R&D facility, but they produce usable product. Right. And because they're producing usable product, they do get the battery credit and the cell pack, you know, the cell credit and the pack credit. Right. And when you add those up, uh, the total is $45 a kilowatt, right? Yes. Kilowatt hour. So that means if we can get from today's price of about $100 a kilowatt hour, down to $45 a kilowatt hour. What does that do to the actual cost of the battery? Well, Brian, I ran a video, I don't know, about five months ago. Were you on that video? You might have been with me on the video. I can't remember. And I don't we remember. About, I think you were. And, we, and the headline was, batteries will be free. <laughs> yes, batteries. It's not crazy to think we could get to that price. China is already seeing lithium at the cell level, lithium batteries at the cell level in the $65 range. Right. That is very encouraging. Now, we don't know what the quality of these cells are. We don't know if these would be uh, ideally suited to automotive use. You can get by with a lot more pack and uh, voltage irregularity on something like a scooter or even stationary storage than you can with an automobile. You really need to get them dialed in. But Either way, anyhow you slice it, this is good news. And Tesla purchased some new equipment recently. Can you tell me about that? Yes. Well, they went to uh, CATL and they said, uh, we noticed that you've got some equipment that you built to make, um, I'm going to forget. Uh, LFP. Oh, LFP. LFP batteries, all these different chemistries. So many things to learn, Brian. Anyway, so you have LFP batteries. You've got this LFP line that you're not going to use for some reason. Maybe it was because, I don't know, General Motors decided not to do the deal or Ford. But what, for whatever reason, you have this line. I think it's a 30 uh, gigawatt line. I'm not sure of the amount. 30, 30 or 35. It was in that range. It was not 10. It wasn't 100. It was in the, I think, 30, 40 range. So would you sell that to us? And we'll put it to work. You can come over and show us how to run it. And we'll pick up another $4.50, a kilowatt, wait, $45 a kilowatt hour for doing those as well. There's another $1.2 billion coming from your, your and my tax dollars. And the beauty is, so LFP is not a new chemistry, but it is new in North America. The competencies among U.S. manufacturers in the building of LFPs is virtually non-existent. 
CATL is a very, very big battery maker. They are the biggest. With a very good reputation. You don't get to be number one by making junk, generally right. speaking. Uh, there, there have been a few exceptions throughout <laughs> history, but not recent, none that come to mind. So then we get to, since we're talking about LFPs, let's talk mega packs. What do you, what do you know about what's going on in uh, Lathrop? Lathrop and Lathrop, yeah. Well, I probably know less about the factory than you do, although you and I both hang out with Bradford Ferguson from time to time. And uh, Bradford Ferguson and I have been talking since he started talking about this stuff because this goes back to, again, the Elon Musk mission. We talked about what was going to happen at Lathrop. I actually held the book up. I held up making any announcements or saying anything on my videos until the book was published because we had breaking news. We broke the story on Lathrop, basically on X and on YouTube. So you've got Lathrop now at theoretically getting close to 10,000 units per year. We don't know where in that ramp it is exactly right now. Bradford doesn't seem to know exactly where it is right now, but that 10,000 units per year is roughly $1.5 million per unit. So you're talking about 15 billion in revenue. Bradford and I and others think it's at least a 25% margin item. So if you're talking about 15 and you talk about 25%, then you're talking about 3.75 billion or a buck plus a share, a buck, buck, 50 a sh buck 30 a share, something like that. You're talking $10 million a day in profit. Right. In profit. And that's right. at a 25% margin, which I think you and I would agree is likely conservative. It's and if you look at the financials, you say, no, 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 look at the financials. The margin's not that big. Right. That's because we're counting all of the expense of these packs since we had to pay it, but not all of the revenue since a lot of it is deferred until it is shipped, installed, and operational. Not all of the revenue is realized. Even, even, even can be within the first six to maybe even 12 months. Yeah. So, and sometimes they even have to reach certain key KPIs, key uh, key indicators. <laughs> so what's P in KPI? Anyway, I forget. Uh, performance, mm -hmm. key performance indicators. So it might have to be hitting some amount of run rate in terms of the amount of electricity that it is dealing with. So, so what is yeah. the bottleneck on uh, mega packs? What's slowing us down? So there's been a lot of conversation about those bottlenecks. And for a while, it was believed that it was the loaders that have to pick up the container. These are container sized uh, units, um, full size, 40 foot container size units. They weigh a substantial amount. I forget the amount. 83,000, I think. 83, it's way 000. over the normal load limit load for limits. the Gen 1 or 2 was like 50, 52,000. And these are substantially heavy. Right. And so you have these uh, loaders that pick it up off of a, pal a set of pallets or whatever, pick it up and put it onto the truck bed or the rail car bed or whatever it is that they're going to do. And those loaders were in short supply. And that's what we, everybody in the community thought was holding up production. Well, those loaders started arriving in October, November, December, but based on current uh, flyovers and, and views and people standing outside and, and getting counts, the count is still not at the level that was anticipated. So there must be other mm, just speeding up the line issues. Maybe we're not 100% sure what's going on there. Then there and was, it does look like they're, they may be adding a second line, which would second, yes. which would just double what we're able to do today. All good news. And then, of course, we'll have the Shanghai Mega Pactory coming online at some point. That's no longer a rumor. There was a, a dedication ceremony, sort of a groundbreaking without any ground broken <laughs> in a location. And I searched every article about it in English and Chinese. I could not find anything that would indicate the actual physical location. Uh, so that was a good couple hours well spent. But it uh, at least we know it's something that they're working on. And these buildings that they're using, they can be existing buildings, as was Lathrop. They can be tilt-ups, which uh, I'm in the tilt. I'm a, I live in tilt-up heaven, I guess. I live in Riverside, California, which is the end of the line or close to the end of the line for all the, the containers that come out of L.A. Harbor. And we have got these uh, distribution centers all around us. And these tilt-ups go up 
in it feels like weeks. It's actually months. months. They go yeah. up real fast. Yeah. Real fast. Yeah, they're they're. It, it, yeah, if you're it, you can go on vacation and when you come back, it is <laughs> visibly almost done. Right. Uh, so that's all good news. These batteries, do these also qualify for the battery pack incentives or just the battery cell incentives if they're they, domestically sourced? They they get the battery pack incentive. Of course, the batteries get the incentive no matter what, but there is a pack involved here as well, yes. And then well, the batteries pack, get an incentive even if they're made in China? No, unfortunately. Oh, not. because most of the LFP cells are still coming from China because they have the capacity right now. But you touched on something interesting a minute ago, which is, all these manufacturers who are pulling back on their EV ambitions are leaving surplus cells in the market. If only there was somebody well positioned to capitalize on it. And I think there is. Any closing thoughts before we ask in the comments, what, uh, what did we miss? What do we misunderstand? Tell us because otherwise, how on earth could we possibly know? Randy, a closing thought? Closing thought is that this is a uh, uh, Elon Musk again has said he wants this to be one terawatt by 2030. If it's one terawatt times $45 a kilowatt, we're talking about a lot. <laughs> it's a it's a little bit. It's a little bit. It's a $450 billion a year uh, just in the amount of money that would I'm sorry, I, I'm not, $450 billion roughly in total sales revenues but it'd be about 4.45 billion dollars just in tax incentive if those incentives are still available and this is how an avalanche starts it starts very subtle very slow someone with a trained eye can see it coming and then it becomes unstoppable uh very exciting guys like subscribe do the usual things you know what to do and because you hung out to the very end i'm going to tell uh, one of my favorite stories a second time. I've told this one before to Randy, but I was at a Waffle House at midnight uh, when I went out to the Cybertruck launch event, visiting with a, a fan who said, hey, I'm going to be in town. Let me take you out to Waffle House. Well, he didn't say, he said, let me buy you dinner, but he got in very late. So I met with him and his wife and his wife is not a Tesla person. She's just along for the ride, just happy to happy to be supportive but she's trying to be more supportive. She's got a book she's reading about, about Elon. And she says, you know, she's picking up on the fact that I know a few things her husband has spoken. Do you know the, do you know these people? And she shows me the Elon Musk mission over there, over there. Gosh, darn it. There it is over there. And on the back of it is Lars and Randy. And I'm like, well, I have, a video out today with Randy. And uh, yes, I have met both of those people. And uh, yes, so I now I get to look like an expert just because I know this jackass. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly, the day I met you was the day I met Lars. And, yeah, uh, it's in San Diego. Yes. Yeah, yes. that was a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think that's enough for today. Randy will be back. We've got a very exciting topic coming up about all about Giga Mexico. Uh, stay tuned for that and uh, stay juicy. And I can't wait to hear from you, Clever Robots, uh, tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs>